Well, this morning, <clears throat> I want to share a word, a word that the Lord has placed upon my heart. And it's a, it's a word that is fitting uh, for a time <clears throat> such as this. Amen. As we know that Christ himself explained to us that right before his coming, right before his second coming, that things will get out of hand. And that the world will experience evil as it's never experienced before. This evil I like to call unrestrained evil. Although our times are evil and they're bad and they're perilous and they're worse than any other time that man has ever lived. Even worse than the days of Noah. The days that we live today are just horrific. But I do want to tell you that even though these times are bad and they're, and they're the worst ever, I want you to know that these are restraint evil days. There are days that, lay, that lie ahead. Days that lie ahead in which the world that we live in today, humanity will experience what is called, or I call, an unrestrained evil. This is once the church is removed at the sound of the trumpet and we're lifted up and we're caught up in the heavens, hallelujah, with Christ and forevermore we shall be. At that moment, hallelujah, the restraints that the Holy Spirit of God had on this world will be removed. And every evil plot, plan, scheme and curse that the enemy has designed against this world because it's made in the image and likeness of God in reference to the people will be released. And men will experience something that they've never experienced before. The Bible said that they will desire death. They will seek death. They will attempt to commit suicide. But yet their attempt will be futile. People of God, for because of the grace and the mercy of God, because of what Christ did on the cross for us, that unrestrained evil we will never experience. For the sound of the trumpet, hallelujah, will occur first. And when that does, we're gone. But at this moment, the evil that we're experiencing does seem uh, does seem uh, as if we were in the end time, as if Christ was about to come, the, uh, his second coming was about to occur, his, his appearance. But people of God, there's a much greater evil than that that's about to be released upon this world. And we got to be grateful and thankful that the Bible says in Revelation 3.10, he told them in Revelation 3.10, he said, because you have kept my word. He says, because you have kept my word and you have kept the patience of my word. He said, I'm going to deliver you from an hour that's about to come upon the world that no man has ever experienced. I will deliver you from that hour. Praise the name of the living God. And that's why we're grateful and we're thankful to God. Because we know we live in evil times, but we know that God will not allow these times to crush us. And these times are so, hallelujah, so evil that Christ himself that said that if these days were not shortened, then not even the elect would make it. So that's the kind of unrestrained evil that the enemy is going to release on this world that is so powerful and so great. Oof. That many will be crushed. But we're grateful and thankful. For we will not experience that. Amen. So I want to go to the word of God. And I want to go to. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 14. Verse 22. And, and I want to share this with you. <coughs> Excuse me. The word of God is read in the name of the Father. The Son and the Holy Ghost. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must do many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Wow. Praise the name of God. I just want you to know that, that although today we're not physically in kingdom of hope ministries church, but what we're doing here today is still considered gathering together so as we are gathered together today this morning and i believe that most of us are are in need of a word most of us are in need of just like uh, uh those early disciples were in need of a word to encourage them to strengthen them i believe that we do today too as well 
So as I pray, I pray that you will also pray while you're home. Pray, pray silently, pray loudly, pray in the spirit, pray in tongues, pray with your own understanding. But the important thing is to pray. Hallelujah. Pray uh, 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 for yourself that, that God would touch your heart and, and teach you what he wants you to learn here today. Pray for those around us that they, they would hear the word of God and accept it this morning. And please pray for me too as well. Hallelujah. Pray that I will be faithful to God's word today and speak everything that God puts in my mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. So I want to share something with you uh, that is very important that we understand. And that is that death is imminent. From the moment we are born to the day we die, we go wasting away. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, the word of God says, Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. That silver cord is in reference to our spinal cord. So it's saying that at some point or another, <laughs> we may even lose the ability to walk. It says, or the golden bowl is broken. That's in reference, hallelujah, to our brain. And broken means that eventually our minds will lose its ability to think, uh, to remember. And we may even forget who we are and who everybody else may be. It goes on to say, or the pitcher shattered out the fountain. That's in reference to our hearts and how some people's hearts may, how they may stop. And I, we, we don't know of what or how we're going to die. But that's not important anyways. It says, or the wheel broken at the well, the heart may stop pumping blood to the rest of your body. This is how our body goes wasting away from the moment we're born to the moment we die. Our body begins to break down, even though the word of God says inwardly, our spirit man will be renewed as every day goes by. It says on verse seven, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, as it was, as Adam was created from the dust. So man shall return back to the dust and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So the whole point here is you, we need to understand that death is imminent. No man shall escape death. The Bible says it is established for man to die once and then comes judgment. The Bible is, doesn't address when or of what a man shall die. It only addresses how is the condition of his soul at the point of death. That's what matters the most. If we go to the book of, of Luke chapter 13, this is a powerful, hallelujah, uh, a question that they asked Jesus. They, they were concerned or, or maybe they wanted to trick him, hallelujah, looking for an explanation to why people die a certain way. And Jesus the Bible says, and starting verse one, hallelujah, Jesus answers by saying there, hallelujah, and Jesus said to them, uh, they asked a question, they wanted to know, and they brought up uh, uh, something that, that happened. It says that they were present at the seasons, uh, some who told them about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. See, Pilate ran up with his soldiers into the place of worship, into the sanctuary, into the house of God, and murdered all the worshipers, and then took their blood. And history says that he added the blood of pigs too, and desecrated the altar, and desecrated the saints, and desecrated the house of God. And Jesus' answer to that was because man always thinks that when, hallelujah, when someone is under affliction or someone is being persecuted or maybe if someone is even sick, that is a sign that God is opposed to him. But let's listen to what Jesus has to say. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? He said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
So here are two different situations. One is a terrorist situation. One is a situation of catastrophe or destivation. But Jesus said it doesn't matter how or what causes a man's death. It doesn't matter what a man dies of. What matters is how is the condition of his soul at the point of death. If we go to the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 1, because there's something interesting of what the word of God says about Job. In verse 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? Well, excuse me, I want to go to verse 1 first. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. So maybe, uh, maybe some believe that the writer said this about himself or hallelujah. But, 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 but in verse eight, we see that this wasn't the position of the writer. This wasn't what the writer was thinking. This wasn't what the people are thinking, but this is what God was saying. So the Lord told Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Look at the description, the characteristics the trace that God points out about Job. Blameless, upright, fears God, shuns evil. But yet God saw it fit to allow him to suffer. He lost everything, house, riches, family, wife, and even wealth. In Job chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the soles of his foot to the crown of his head sickness and he took for himself a pot shred and which with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes people it's not about the affliction it's not about the tribulations and the difficulties because that's gonna come there's no way to avoid that. If Christ himself said, in the world you shall have affliction, you shall have trouble. That is a command. The Bible says that from the days of John, the Baptist, to the days of Christ, the kingdom of God has suffered violence, and only those that are willing to take it by force shall enter. The kingdom of God is not a bed of roses. The kingdom of God is not a place for cowards. For in the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verse 8, it gives you a list of those that won't enter. In cowards, those that fold under the pressure, the word of God says will not enter into the kingdom of God. That's why the word of God says the apostles strengthened them. They were on their way. They were on their way to the kingdom of God. They, they were seeking God. And, and the persecutions and, and the trials and the tribulations and the difficulty hallelujah, were, were, were causing them to doubt, were causing them to weaken, were causing their faith to weaken. And, hallelujah, and the word of God teaches that the disciples, the apostles, gave them a word of encouragement. And that word of encouragement was, don't give up, don't quit, don't throw in the towel, for it is necessary that we must endure many things on our way to the kingdom of God. It's unavoidable. There's a purpose behind it. And I say that Job lost his wife. I know that many say, oh, he didn't lose his wife. He did lose his wife because she turned on him. In Job 2.9, it says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. So the purpose of the affliction when the enemy brings it is for us to fold. It's for us to, to, to curse God and die. It's so that we break our integrity, we break our belief in God, that we lose faith. But just as Jesus said, don't lose heart, cheer up. Why? Because if God be for you, who could be against you? But why? Sometimes many will ask, why my God? Why allow a man who is upright, blameless, fears you and shuns evil to suffer? Well, there's two important things here that I want to share with you. The first one is God allowed that so that Job could have an impersonal encounter. 
Because when we go to Job 42.5, it's very clear. In Job 42.5, it says, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Praise the name of the living God. So it was all about God wanting to, hallelujah, Job, to have a personal encounter with him. To go from one that hears of God to be one that sees God. See, God doesn't want us just to know of his works or hear of his words, but God wants us to know his ways, personally and intimately. And he allows affliction, hallelujah, he allows difficulty, trials and tribulations, and even sickness. To bring about an encounter with him. Praise the name of the living God. If we go to Romans chapter 8 verse 29. This is my second point. Why does God allow affliction? Why does God allow trials and tribulations and difficulty? Why is it that we must enter into the kingdom of God through these things? Because there's a, there's a work that God wants to do with you and me. And that work that God wants to do in us. It's not ministerial work. And all that is good. It's not even about, hallelujah, finances and becoming rich. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's something deeper than that that God wants to do in our lives. And that is conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. As each day goes by, God wants us looking more and more like Jesus. And that it could be possible and sometimes necessary to go through many things and endure many things on our way to the kingdom of God. Praise the name of the living God. We also go to 1 Corinthians 15, 49. 15, 49. It promises that just as we have borne the image of man of dust, and that's speaking about Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, and that man is Jesus. That's why when people look at us, when we speak, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we interact with others is very essential that they see the character and the nature of Christ in us. So what should be our position when it comes to suffering? When we're being afflicted, when we're going through trials and tribulations, what should be our position? When we go to James 1.12, the word of God says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Steadfast, endurance, perseverance, all the way to the end. Because Jesus said, those that endure to the end, those that persevere to the end shall be saved. This is about we must endure people of God. We must not focus on the difficulties, the trials and tribulations. We must not focus on the chaos that's going on in the world. Because then we will be like Peter, that when he was walking on the water to Jesus, he took his eyes off of Jesus and he put it on the affliction. And then he began to sink. We must set our eyes upon Jesus, we must cast all our cares upon Jesus. I want to tell you something. Just like those Pharisees and Sadducees or the people of Jesus' day had that question and they asked them that question. Hmm? Thinking that because of the way a man dies or because... He's born with an illness. Many things, hallelujah, some people think that the person has been cursed by God or because the person is living in sin and that is so far from the truth. The word of God is very clear, hallelujah, that all men shall suffer some way or form or another. We're not exempt from trials and tribulations. We're not exempt from sicknesses. We're not exempt. The Lord allows it to the sun to shine on the good and the bad. He allows the rain, hallelujah, hallelujah, not only to fall on the good or the bad, hallelujah, but 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 God, hallelujah, also allows, hallelujah, the, the snow from heaven to, to refresh the ground upon all mankind. 
kind. Hallelujah. No one is exempt from difficulty. We shall all see it at some point or another. The Bible is clear. In John chapter 9, they brought a blind young man to Jesus. And what man is common to do is accuse or condemn this young man or his parents of a personal sin. And this is why this young man was born like that. And, and then suggesting, therefore, that any child born into the world with sickness is because of sin, his personal sin, or his parents' sin. But Jesus wanted to address that and to make it clear that it had nothing to do with the sins of the parents or the sins of this young man, not the personal ones, but so that the glory of God could be seen. Why are you being afflicted so the glory of God could be seen? Why are, hallelujah, why is COVID hit you so that the glory of God may be seen? Why is cancer hit so that the glory of God may be seen? Why is it that there's problems in my marriage so that the glory of God may be seen? In the end, God will receive the glory. We must just endure for a moment. And although we have little strength and little, hallelujah, strength, the word of God teaches us that God sees our efforts. And he will honor them. Hallelujah. If you also go to John 11, 4. The same thing. It says Jesus. Hallelujah. But when Jesus heard it, he said this illness. Says, we, we know this is in, in reference to. Hallelujah. To his good friend. Hallelujah. In the book of John chapter 11. We know that Jesus' good friend Lazarus dies of an illness. Everyone is in chaos, probably not understanding. Hallelujah. How is the Messiah, the son of the living God's friend, die while well, he's still alive? It's because, men, sometimes we see illness as an impossibility. We see illness as an obstacle, as a partition. We see illness as a, as a way of, hallelujah, of, 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 of crushing us. But God doesn't see it like that. God sees it as an opportunity to shine. God sees it as an opportunity so that his glory may be seen. And that's why Jesus said, this illness is not an illness unto death. He said, it's for the glory of God. I know it's hard for many religious people to understand that. But this kingdom of God is not a bed of roses. The kingdom of God, hallelujah, is about people who know how to be violent. And not violent in the flesh, but violent in the spirit. People who know how to fight in the spirit, how to war in the spirit, how to war in tongues, how to war in fasting, how to war in the word of God to bring about the glory of God. Hallelujah. To bring about results. Hallelujah. All for the glory of God. The book of Ecclesiastic, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. Because once again, many Christians think that we're exempt from these things. But it says, but all this I laid to heart, examining it all. Mm -hmm. We lay this to heart too. We take a lot of things personal. And these things cause us to examine, to observe. And this is what he observed. He said, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. See, that's what we have to understand. It's not about the affliction. It's about my life is in the hands of God and God has my best interest at heart. That's why Paul could say, hallelujah, that, 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 hallelujah, that yes, he, he, he desired to be here and help people and preach and teach for their own good. But he said he also desired to go home and be with the Lord because to him, death was a gain. I ask you today, to you, is death a gain? To you, does death equate to being in the presence of God? To you, does death equate to walking on the streets of gold? Does death equate to my heavenly mansion? Does death equate to eternity with Christ? Hmm. How does God feel about those that judge others in their moment of affliction? Because those that are religious, 
to have the tendency to judge people's affliction. In Job 42, 7, listen good, because Job had three friends and his wife with a religious mindset. They believed that because he was afflicted, and remember, it wasn't just he lost his riches, his land, his family, hallelujah, his property, hallelujah, and, and that his wife had turned on him, but he was even hit and struck with an illness in his body. Yet the word of God says in Job 42, 7, when he was all said and done, when Job stood his ground against his wife and against his friends, and then God says, now it's time for me to speak. Listen to what he says. He says, after the Lord has spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So anybody that has a mindset that people who are afflicted going through trials and tribulations and difficulty, it is a, that, that, that is a result of God not favoring them or being displeased with them. Well, I want to tell you something this morning. God says that you ain't right. And that his anger is burning against you. People of God, we must endure for on our way to the kingdom of God. We must go through many trials and tribulations. Paul said that he was confirming or strengthening their souls. Strengthening. The way that we strengthen people in their time of affliction is by giving them a word of encouragement. It's by telling them stand steadfast, persevere, Endure, for this is necessary as we are on our way to the kingdom of God. But you must know and understand, hallelujah, that, that, hallelujah, that what God has prepared for us, that what God has reserved for us, the thought of it, the imagination of it, the glory of it, man is not able yet to comprehend it. Praise the name of the God. Says he was he was strengthening them with a word of encouragement in their souls, in their hearts, in their minds. They weren't scholars yet. They were just beginning. So the, the apostles had to strengthen them in their faith. And it says he was they were encouraged them through exhortation. If we go to Acts 13:43. See, when you give a word of encouragement. When you tell people and let the people of God know, hallelujah, that, that, hallelujah, that, that it, we must endure many trials and tribulations and difficulties as we're on our way to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. But to be cheerful, hallelujah, to look up because we know that our redemption is near and we know that, hallelujah, for God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son to us. Hallelujah. When we stand on the word of God, we stand on the promises of God. The Bible says, that people will be persuaded and they will continue in the grace of God. Listen good. It says, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, listen good, speaking to them, remember that our words are powerful. There's life and death in the power of our tongue. And by our words, we shall be justified or condemned. So he says, when we speak to them words of encouragement, they will be persuaded to continue in the grace of God. Praise the name of the living God. The word of God says, and that we must. <laughs> it's proper. It's fit that we endure. It doesn't mean that we expect fatality. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're expecting some devastation or catastrophe to happen to us. But that we are not to expect that it won't happen otherwise neither. 
Our focus doesn't have to even be on death or affliction or trials and tribulation. Our focus always has to be on Jesus. It always has to be on the prize. That's why Paul always, hallelujah, pointed towards the eternity so that we can have an eternal perspective. That's why he says, hey, I look at the crown that's been reserved for me. Hallelujah. I look at the things that God has in store for me. Streets of gold, eternity, a body that never hurt or ever be sick again. But for now, we must endure on our way to the kingdom of God, many trials and tribulations, and all for the glory of God. I want to share these last little four points with you. I want you to take them with you because they're very important. And these are what I see in the word of God. And why Paul said we must, we must endure. And why do we have to endure? Because the world opposes us. The world hates us. If it hated Jesus and rejected Jesus, who do you, what, what do you think that they're going to do to me and you? If they hurt the green tree, what do you think they're going to do to the dry? In Ephesians chapter 2, 1, and th one through 3, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, children of wrath, just as the others. Hallelujah. So that's the position of the world. Why? Because the devil is the ruler of this world. He is the God of this world. And he knows nothing else but to kill, steal, and destroy. He is a liar. He's the father of all lies. And he lied from the beginning. And all he wants to do is deceive you. Listen good. The word of God says in James 4, 4, adulterers and adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world opposes us. The world hates us because it's God and its ruler is the devil. It's the pit of hell. So therefore it hates us. So that's why the world afflicts us. That's why they persecute us. That's why they splendor us. That's why they speak all kinds of evil of us. But they don't know that we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Hallelujah. John 1, 1 John 5, 19 says, We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked. Well, the whole world. Lies under the sway of the wicked one. And that's why the world afflicts us. The world persecutes us. Point number two, it is necessary to reclaim us from wandering and to keep us in the path of duty. Yes, that's why God allows affliction. Because in Psalm 119, 67, listen to what David says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. See, when we're afflicted, we tend to seek God more. We tend to grab a hold of them and not want to let go. But when all is well and all is good and we're super blessed, for some reason we tend to forget about God and we go astray and start living as if God didn't even exist. And sometimes man will wind up in the pig's pen like the prodigal son, but even there, in that affliction, he came to himself and realized that it was always best with God. Hallelujah. It's essential for us to understand that. That the affliction, when it comes, is because God wants to bring us back. Hallelujah. It also says in verse 71 right there in Psalm 119, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Can you say that this morning? Because there's many people running from God. There's many Jonas listening to me right now. Running from God. And right now they're, they're under pressure. They, they feel that the heat is on. 
God is allowing many affliction, trials, and tribulations to your life. And it's because God wants you to come back home. Your affliction is good because it will teach you to keep God's word. Your affliction will bring you home and cement you in the word of God. Point three, it is necessary to wean us from the world. It is necessary to wean us from the world to keep before our minds the great truth that we have here. In this world, no continuing city and no abiding place. Hmm. Trial here makes us pant for a world of rest, a world of peace. The opposition of sinners makes us desire <clears throat> that world where the wicked shall cease from troubling and where they shall be eternal friendships and peace. When the affliction gets to us, the trials and tribulations, when it begins to wear on us and begins to wear us down, and it's because we're accepting this life as our portion. This life is not our portion. This body is not your portion. The house you live in, although it is, it could be a mansion, that is not your portion, for God has a heavenly mansion for you. This body and it's aching and how it breaks down and it gets sick is not your portion. Your portion is the resurrected body, just like Christ had. That is our portion. Our body will be similar to his. It will not feel no pain. It will, it will never see death. It will not have boundaries. It will not have limits. Praise the name of the living God. This life is not our portion. Our portion is eternity. Praise the name of the living God. I want to finish with this last word I want to share with you. And point four is when we are persecuted and afflicted, listen good, we may remember that it has been the lot of Christians from the beginning. We tread a path that has been watered by the tears of the saints and rendered sacred by the shedding of the best blood on the earth. The Savior trod that path and it is enough that the disciple be as his master and the servant of his Lord. Jesus said that himself, that it was best for us to be like the master and, and the servant as his Lord, not to be greater. Here's the problem. Jesus had to suffer. He was afflicted. He was a persecuted. But we think that we don't need to be. <laughs> if he endured it, he said you got to be like your master. You don't, you don't have to be more than your master, nor are you to be less, but you are to be equal. How he lived, what he went through, what he endured, we must also endure that same affliction. Hallelujah. There's no other way to glory unless we go through the story. Praise the name of the living God. There's no other way. He said through much tribulation, not some but too much, various kinds. That's why Peter said, count it all joy. It doesn't matter what comes your way, count it joy, because you know, hallelujah, that God is purifying you through the affliction, hallelujah, through the sickness, whatever it is, there's God doing a work in you. And the evil that the enemy intends, God will turn it in your favor and God will cause everything right now in this season that you're going through to work for your spiritual good. We must endure, people of God. God wants us to be valiant, courageous. He told Joshua, fear not. Don't worry about it. He said, be strong, be courageous, be valiant. For the Lord your God will be with you always. So people, I want to pray with you right now. I want you to know that, that we love you. We want to encourage you to endure all the way to the end. Don't 
Don't focus on the afflictions. Don't focus on the trials and tribulations and difficulties of our time. For it's all necessary. But God will not allow us to falter. He is both faithful and able to keep us from falling. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise for your awesome God. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, who lives, dwells, and abides in us, who guides us to all truth and to all righteousness. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, who bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. We thank you, Almighty Lord, because we know, hallelujah, that, hallelujah, that, hallelujah, it doesn't matter the trials and tribulations of the difficulty. Jesus said it. He said there's two foundations. There's a rock and there's sand. And even those that are on the rock with those that are on the sand, all shall suffer. All shall go through it. The rain is going to come. The wind is going to come. The storm is going to come. Just because we are believers does not mean that the storm is not going to hit. All we must show is that we are founded on the rock. The devil's going to huff and puff and attempt to blow our house down. But if our house is on the rock, bless your people, my God. Holy Spirit of God, visit them right now. That they may feel your presence. Hallelujah. A double portion of your presence right now in the name of Jesus. Touch bodies, my God. Heal, my Lord. Break yokes, my God. In the name of Jesus. Deliver, my Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise for your awesome God and we love you. God bless you all. We love you guys, and we will be in touch. Praise the Lord.